Uh, first, I'd just like to thank everyone for coming out and making this great DEF CON. This has been my first DEF CON and I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I had a lot of great speakers here and it's been fabulous attending and just hope uh, speaking is half as fun. <laughs> anyway, uh, my handle is Skunkworks and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, hacking the global economy with GPUs or how I learned to stop worrying and love Bitcoin. Uh, then first we'll start off with the usual housekeeping. I'm not a Bitcoin developer. I only play one on television. Um, I'm an undergrad in electrical engineering, uh, kind of a phone freak and a hardware guy. This is my, you know, as I said, first DEF CON and I'm not affiliated with Lockheed Martin, you know, just in case you're wondering from the handle. Uh, I'm going to try and cover as much as possible in this 20 minute turbo talk. Um, kind of trying to aim this at all levels of Bitcoin to the best, or all levels of knowledge about Bitcoin to the best of my ability. Uh, feel free to go ahead and contact me, anything about the talk or any further mm -hmm. questions. And um, again, talks for informational purposes, uh, don't do anything stupid. <laughs> uh, so first, kind of some real basics about Bitcoin, how it came about, um, kind of some of the reasons behind it. I'm sure a lot of you are already familiar with this, but uh, a lot of other payment solutions online right now are plagued by extremely high fees. You know, you've got uh, high fees by PayPal, you've got uh, fees on debit cards, uh, crazy, crazy interest rates on credit cards. Uh, very little in the way of privacy online right now for payment solutions aside from Bitcoin. You know, PayPal tends to play money police. They do chargebacks all the time. Credit card companies do chargebacks all the time. Uh, they are kind of running your money. You're not running your money. Uh, and then, of course, you've got credit card companies amassing these huge, huge databases of purchase histories and, uh, you know, user information, really for who knows what. So uh, there is really no way to pay cash online before Bitcoin, and that's kind of, sorry, uh, mic's falling. That's kind of, uh, I think, one of the main reasons it came about. Uh, then on top of that, you've also got the issue of regulation by governments, as we all know, in the huge economic collapse after the uh, subprime fiasco. Uh, government regulation is not always a good thing and, you know, lack of oversight can really cause some problems and uh, so that's another thing Bitcoin's trying to address is decentralizing money. Uh, so then what and who? Bitcoin is a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency. I'm sure you're all well aware. Uh, the slide actually hasn't been updated. It was worth about a hundred million dollars when I put the slide together. There's since been another crash. It's down to around 55 million, trading at uh, eight dollars or so a Bitcoin as of this morning. Um, it's based on SHA-256, mined or minted, uh, mostly with GPUs, and uh, as far as everyone knows, it's legal. It's kind of a bit of a gray area. It doesn't really meet the standards of a currency under U.S. federal law. On the other hand, the EFF, uh, to my knowledge, stopped accepting donations in Bitcoin a while ago, so I'm, I'm really not completely sure on the legality of it, and I'm not sure that anyone is completely sure on the legality of it, but uh, it's certainly grown to quite massive proportions and there haven't been any widespread, uh, you know, Treasury Department raids on Bitcoin mining operations yet. So uh, Bitcoin was initially put together by this highly enigmatic developer, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, this is likely a pseudonym. He left supposedly in 2010 after contributing this huge base of code and kind of the basic rules that the Bitcoin protocol operates on. And he may or may not have profited enormously from developing Bitcoin. He may have profited, that is, if he was running uh, a lot of Bitcoin mining equipment after he first developed the software before he let it go public. No one, again, is completely sure because of the semi-anonymous uh, nature of Bitcoin. I'm going to touch on this a lot more later. Uh, Bitcoin is not at least outright a Ponzi scheme. There's no central company that's running it. And it's also really not controlled in much of any manner except these uh, core developers who just ma basically maintain the code and uh, kind of keep things in running order. It's also not backed by anything. The idea is just kind of, well, you use bitcoins and I'll use bitcoins and we'll all say it has value. And the idea being that there's scarcity behind them. You can't just uh, kind of pull them out of thin air in great quantities. So uh, that's kind of the idea of the intrinsic value of them, even though they're not backed by anything. Um, so basically, you've got Bitcoin miners uh, minting Bitcoins with generally graphics processing units, also application-specific integrated circuits. I'll get to that a little later. Um, when people uh, 
mine these bitcoins. They're stored in a wallet.dat file. Then every transaction is hashed into this big chain that kind of goes around the entire network. That's really an oversimplification. Most mining's pooled now, but that's kind of the basics of it. Uh, then, as we move into the economics, mining is designed to become exponentially harder and harder, leading to a uh, finite supply of roughly 21 million bitcoins. Uh, they can be traded in quantities as little as one ten millionth of a bitcoin. Uh, as I said, they're minted now mostly by uh, graphics processing units, but then you can also use uh, CPUs, which are quite inefficient now, and uh, possibly application-specific integrated circuits that is a special piece of hardware only designed for mining bitcoins may uh, maybe some of the bitcoin uh, mining power now. Um, it's loosely tied to other currencies via energy and equipment costs. You know, you'd think Bitcoin just being kind of this decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency, it would just be a completely free market. Um, but, you know, the reality is you can only buy computer hardware, mostly in U.S. dollars, at least from the, uh, you know, central distributors, and your power costs are still going to be in U.S. dollars. That's assuming you're in the U.S. If you're in Europe, it's going to be in the euro, et cetera. Uh, and we actually saw that a lot. There was a major deflation again in Bitcoin just last week it, with the uh, entire debt ceiling fiasco. And that, you know, kind of had a ripple effect in Bitcoin. We saw Bitcoin prices dropping. Also, there was a, another event that uh, kind of happened at the same time. But I think the debt ceiling was part of it. Uh, anyway, if Bitcoin does ultimately become a stable currency, uh, profits for mining Bitcoins are going to have to go down to zero because mining does become exponentially harder. And uh, early adopters have definitely won big in Bitcoin. If you started mining back when Bitcoin uh, first started out, then you made a lot of money on it. Late adopters at least were still covering costs until about a week ago when we had this uh, second kind of market collapse. And supply and demand curves kind of uh, explain everything relatively well. If you look at the blue there, that's your supply curve. The two red ones are your demand curves. And you know, basically, you just have the shifts in those two curves affects your equilibrium that the uh, price will tend towards. Bitcoin had 200,000% uh, inflation over the last several months. Really, really explosive growth to a high of uh, over $30 a Bitcoin back in June. Uh, then it devalued to about half of that to... Uh, uh, $15 and then uh, was stable over most of July. Looked like it was finally tending toward an equilibrium. We saw relatively steady trade volume and relatively steady prices in Bitcoin markets. And then just last week with the whole debt ceiling fiasco combined with a uh, either a large break-in or large expose of a uh, scam with a site mybitcoin.com uh, about a quarter million dollars of Bitcoins just kind of left when the site went down and no one's exactly sure what's up and that caused Bitcoin prices to drop to around uh, eight dollars that combined with the whole debt ceiling thing. Um, so again this slide's a little outdated this is showing uh, back when I put this together I thought we were kind of looking at an equilibrium price around 14 to 15 dollars. Uh, great quote kind of to illustrate this $30 spike is media is like the weather, only it's man-made weather out of the old uh, Oliver Stoneville natural born killers. And that's really pretty applicable to what happened with Bitcoin at the $30 spike. I don't think uh, investors alone would have ever put it up to $30 that quickly if it hadn't been for all the media attention. And uh, media just kind of created a very, very large demand pull inflation. People were just buying Bitcoins left and right sitting on them. And that's what drove the prices up so high, really to unsustainable levels. Then you had this big currency exchange, Mt. Gox, getting hacked. I'll get to that a little later in my talk. And they, uh, you know, that really just kind of caused Bitcoin to lose a lot of its value. And then, as I said, there was the second break into an e-wallet provider, mybitcoin.com, very recently that caused yet a, uh, another drop that we don't see on this graph. So uh, profit or slow decline thereof, uh, you can see the exponential scale here of uh, mining profits for your, you know, Bitcoin miners. And um, this does kind of reinforce the fact that if Bitcoin does survive as a currency, it's going to have to stabilize at some type of equilibrium. Uh, if you try to put a straight line through all those data points, you're going to notice you've basically got an exponential drop off in uh, Bitcoin mining profits down to people just covering costs um, as time progresses. Then what's happened in the last several months as the Bitcoin network has gotten so large is you've had people pooling their resources together in Bitcoin mining. The reason being that 50 Bitcoins are generated uh, every 10 minutes roughly. It's generally a little faster than that when the network was uh, growing very quickly. Um, but, you know, only having these 
blocks of 50 bitcoins being generated every 10 minutes. If you're an average bitcoin miner out there, you might be mining one of these blocks every, uh, you know, two months. So that's where the idea came in of pooling resources together and getting smaller payouts much more quickly. Um, and some pool operators are taking a cut. The administrator of DeepBit.net, which was the largest mining pool for quite a while, I'm not sure if it still is. I haven't really kept up with mining pool stats. But he was clearing over $30,000 a month, and that's a conservative estimate at one point, and that went on for at least uh, two, three months at that rate. Uh, mining pools introduce a huge attack vector on Bitcoin. We had already an incident where DeepBit got uh, the payout addresses, you know, the Bitcoin addresses of users that uh, the coins are paid out to changed. And, uh, you know, I'll cover that a little later in attack vectors. But uh, they definitely introduce a pretty large surface that uh, criminals can get at. Then kind of the scary stuff with botnets, and there's already been a botnet spotted in the wild mining bitcoins, is if you have a botnet that plays by the rules, there's really no way to distinguish it from regular mining traffic unless you, uh, you know, figure out that the botnet is a botnet by looking at command and control channels or finding infected systems, etc. But looking at the bitcoin end, it looks just like uh, regular bitcoin miners. Um, and the interesting thing with Bitcoin, unlike just about everything else, is if you're a botnet, you're better off not actually trying to DDoS Bitcoin or take it down. You're better off just simply playing by the rules and making money at it. And in fact, I did a couple conservative calculations. There are probably dozens of botnets out there right now that could net the botmaster $100,000 a day doing that. And frankly, we don't necessarily have any way of knowing that a very well-coded botnet is not responsible for half of Bitcoin's hashing power at the moment. Um, attack vector wallet.dat. All of uh, Bitcoin users' coins are stored in this, you know, single file. Um, it is in plain text. You know, the Bitcoins represent the public keys and your uh, private keys, the right to spend them stored in wallet.dat. If you read the frickin' manual, you're going to encrypt wallet.dat. Most people don't, including this uh, one guy going by the handle all in vain, who stored about half a million dollars worth of Bitcoins in a single file. He was compromised by some type of targeted attack. Uh, he lost everything. So, good quote here, based on the findings of the report, my conclusion was that this idea was not a practical deterrent for reasons which at the moment must be all too obvious, Dr. Strangelove from the movie that's kind of the theme of the title. Um, basically what I'm saying here is uh, having a plain text wallet dot dat when you've got a lot of non-tech savvy people dealing with Bitcoin is inherently a kind of poor idea and you're going to run into a lot of... Um, a lot of different ways to so-called pickpocket wallet.dat. There are people who are leaving their systems wide open, sharing their entire hard drive on LimeWire. Um, there have been a couple different specialized Trojan horses spotted in the wild that specifically grab wallet.dat and upload it. Um, and gullible users are gullible. Uh, they're even open to traditional 419 scams, which I'll touch on a bit more. Uh, basically, any third party that's part of Bitcoin, you know, the currency exchanges, wallet storage sites, that is, if you're too stupid to encrypt your own wallet, why not outsource it to a kind of virtual bank for Bitcoins? Um, gift card exchanges, mining pools, lotteries, stock markets, all of these services are out there, and all of them have varied levels of security. The Bitcoin protocol itself has a decent level of security. I think Dan Kaminsky's talk was... Uh, was very illustrative of that. Uh, you know, he did obviously drop that exploit, but still, the protocol in general is relatively sound, but these third parties vary very wildly in security. They're generally a lot less secure than the actual Bitcoin protocol and generally a lot less secure than established financial institutions. Had DeepBit.net, the big mining pool, getting hacked into, um, undisclosed amounts stolen through undisclosed attack vector, uh, changing payment addresses, and then the administrator, Taicho, reimbursed users for however much was lost. Uh, one has to think when he was making 30 grand a month, he didn't want his uh, income to go away and might have just paid out of pocket. Who knows? Uh, then also this big currency exchange for Bitcoin where you could exchange uh, U.S. dollars for Bitcoins, Mt. Gox. They uh, were using unsalted passwords for quite a while, and then they ultimately switched over to salted passwords, but for users who hadn't logged in in a while, their accounts still had unsalted password hashes. And um, basically what happened is someone through, again, an undisclosed attack vector got a hold of the username and, uh, you know, password hash database, ran it through your run-of-the-mill hash lookup table and uh, got about access to $9 million worth of accounts, attempted to withdraw the money, trading ended up freezing for about a week and that uh, devalued the Bitcoin market from about $200 million to about $100 million because of lack of confidence. Um, an attack vector dimwits. Uh, Fool and his bitcoins are soon parted. 
You can have traditional 419 style scams, such as I'm a Nigerian prince with 89 million bitcoins, and you know you can have fake gift card sites. Plenty of those have been spotted in the wild. Fake investment sites, uh, fake mining pools, possibly. I'm not sure that we've seen any in the wild yet, but uh, it's certainly a real possibility. Fake currency exchanges are definitely out there. No chargeback really means easy pickings. You know, you can't call up American Express and say, uh, hey, someone just stole 500 bitcoins from me. Can you guys do a chargeback? <laughs> there's definitely an inverse correlation with tech savvy and victimization among things like this. Uh, there's really no patch for human stupidity. So if you've got stupid people using bitcoin, you're going to run into a lot of theft. Um, then attack vector whales and HFT kind of borrowed uh, a whale term from Las Vegas here, but uh, anyone with enough assets can really directly move the Bitcoin market. This is kind of more an economic attack, but uh, the idea would be that you have enough assets to exert partial market power, and then you can just sell and buy, and that would artificially inflate and deflate the price. Uh, you can pretty well camouflage that by simply splitting up all of your uh, large accounts into a bunch of small accounts. And it's pretty hard to distinguish from regular trading when the market's fluctuating enough. Then uh, high frequency trading, already probably read about this on Wall Street, but that's where you have automated trading for small marginal gain repeated ad infinitum. Coupled with uh, market movers, you can really get an unfair advantage, um, but the market does become harder to move the more Bitcoin grows. Then uh, vending machines and Finney, this is the Finney attack. Basically, if you accept a transaction without having any confirmations, the attacker can create an unbro uh, unbroadcasted block and then send the same coins to himself in that block. Then, let's say, walk up to a vending machine that takes bitcoins, and uh, by the time the vending machine has its transaction processed, the attacker's already sent their bitcoins to himself instead of the vending machine. Um, so, a pretty simple solution around this is to just have some type of stored value card where you require instant transactions. You know, if you need to use bitcoins at 7 Eleven or a vending machine, you just go ahead and load up your stored value card and then you use that. Uh, BRB FBI. So, <laughs> yeah. Dan Kaminsky already really touched on this a lot. I'm going to skip over a lot of this, but. Uh, the basic thing is a lot of what's done in Bitcoin is public, you know, the addresses, the transaction records. Uh, in theory, as far as anonymity goes, this in and of itself wouldn't be a problem. What ends up happening though is you've got a lot of users, like he said, on forums who are, uh, you know, posting, hey, donate to my Bitcoin address, or, you know, you've got uh, people reusing the same Bitcoin addresses over and over again. And what you can do, and what uh, Reed Harrigan showed in their paper, I'd highly recommend everyone to go out and read that paper, is that uh, Bitcoin is really not that anonymous, you know, unless you're sitting around war driving 10 towns away, you know. It's, uh, it's just not that anonymous, and sites like Silk Road have really started to give it quite a bad name. Um, but basically, don't be surprised if the party van rolls up if you're doing illegal stuff on Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, then we've got application-specific integrated circuits. Already kind of talked about this, but the idea behind it is you've got a uh, specialized piece of computing hardware, specialized chip that would be uh, custom-built just for mining Bitcoins or just for doing uh, SHA-256. Uh, very high upfront development costs in this, but they're much more efficient than using graphics processing units for mining bitcoins. Uh, I've already got an anecdotal report, but they're deployed in at least one bitcoin mining operation. And again, just like a botnet, they could represent a very high percentage of network hashing capacity, and we really wouldn't have any way of telling. Then um, we've got the GPU shortages that have been caused by Bitcoin. The Radeon HD 5800 and 5900 series have been the hardest hit uh, right about the time Bitcoin went up to $30. Uh, there were just huge shortages, like my local micro center had no uh, X800 or X900 series Radeon GPUs left in stock. The week, the week Bitcoin hit 30, they even, I think, had some X700 selling out. People were that desperate to mine Bitcoins and get in on the action. Demand pull inflation has been driving up retail prices about 30%. I think they're starting to come back down a bit now with the uh, fever around Bitcoin dying down a little. Uh, the 5,000 series are more efficient than the 6,000 series in mining bitcoins, and even the 6,000 series beats NVIDIA by a lot. Um, the GPU hash cracking talk yesterday had a, had a pretty interesting, uh, some pretty interesting info about that. Uh, each GPU was representing around $15 a day in profits of revenue, or $15 a day in uh, revenue at peak prices. Um, and then a couple oddities that are relatively funny. We've uh, run across a couple... 
Uh, anecdotes of Bitcoin miners suspected of growing marijuana because they've had very high electric bills. They've been raided, and it turns out, well, they're farming currency. <laughs> you know, they've got a server farm going, and it's just using a really lot of power. Uh, there's one Bitcoin miner also who suffered brain damage after heat stroke. He slept in an unair conditioned room with a uh, bunch of mining rigs, and you know, don't do that. But coin.org has a lot of pretty good humorous stories like that. And uh, that's pretty much it. Any quick questions? Mm-hmm. <laughs>